Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Differentiators. I'm your host Aditya, and I have my co-host Reyes with me today. Our today's guest is Dr. Shilpa Dutter, founder of Swayam. Shilpa has transformed the fields of personality and behavioral assessments through psychometric testing that incorporates rich values of Indian knowledge traditions. So um, her company Swayam has been enabling institutions. to uh, to help students to recognize their potential thereby paving a path for their brighter future so i am also helps uh, hr professionals hand pick the best possible candidate for for every profile so uh, thank you dr shilpa thanks for joining us thanks for taking your time out thank you thank you shreyas and thank you so much for having me here today thank you it's a pleasure ma'am thank you so uh, our first question is um, you know i just want to uh, ask uh, this generally is uh, how can psychology help in in uh, personality and, and behavioral assessment so okay, can you just talk a little bit about that briefly yeah so when you go to any doctor first thing is that they try to understand your physical physiological and anatomical structure and you know mm-hmm. what is going wrong uh, you know for them to be able to assess you and uh, give you a kind of treatment to help you feel better correct in the same way for us psycholo- psychology is extremely important to understand why people behave the way they do mm-hmm. because not everybody if you put uh, 10 people into a situation um into a stressful situation not everybody is going to be stressed not everybody is going to behave the same way that you expect them to each one of us come with a lot of uh, um a background in the ter- in terms of what we have learned what we have been exposed to and what we think is the ideal way of behaving and that makes us behave the way we do in any given situation mm-hmm. and so it's very important to understand psychology so that we can understand behavior to be able to see why people behave the way they do and see how we can modify that behavior if it's not in a um in a socially desirable range i won't say normal because there is no new no, there is no normal anymore correct yeah. so yeah. what is socially desirable each society has its own way of understanding behavior of accepting uh, uh, you know what we call as um, uh, culturally specific behavior so what it is is dictated so that's why we need to understand psychology right So, so as part of your value offering at Swayam, so so what is it that you offer? So is it um, is it a software? Is it a psychometric tests, uh, or or is it anything else? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So at Swayam, we have developed psychometric tests to assess personality, but it is based on the Vedic principles. Okay. Okay. So there is a field of thought of knowledge that is called as Indian psychology. for lack of a better terminology so it doesn't mean that it's restricted to an indian population mm-hmm. but it is what it means is that it is derived from the indian philosophical tradition like the vedas upanishads bhagavad gita sankhya yoga uh, the puranas uh, yoga vasishta so there are so many classical literature and classical texts uh, that deal a lot with manas uh it's not mind you can uh, loosely translated it means mind but manas is so much more than the english version of mind so how do we understand a person how do we understand a person's behavior has all been explained in the classical texts okay so what is yoga why was yoga why did yoga come up uh yoga came into being because there was a huge need for people to um find that oneness with god that ekaikate with ishvara with uh, you know ishvara pranidhana which is what yoga is totally about so for one person to be able to achieve that oneness with god there are so many other levels because you can't just physically you need to prepare yourself no so if a person wants to uh, attempt his 10th standard exams uh, you can't just say the minute the child is born you can't expect him to go and attend the 10th standard exams so the child has to go through stay uh, you know lkg ukg standard 1 2 whatever 9 and 10 and then only he can attend in the same way if you want to have that ekaikate with god with ishvara then you need to be able to sit and do that kind of meditation that intense focus so to achieve that what is it that is needed so that was the entire basis of the 
physical form of yoga as we know it today, which is what is practiced predominantly today. So that entire thing leads to you getting that one pointed concentration. And at one point, it elevates you into that level of Ishwara Pranitana for that oneness with the Almighty. So this kind of uh, rigor that was there, that was that is one aspect of it. The other aspect is why do people behave the way they do? How can I categorize the different uh, behavior in people? Can I put them into a, can there be a typology? So those are the different kinds of answers that are given. And what I have done is to collate all those different kinds of thought, different kinds of interpretations and import it into the domain of both English and psychology, and then developed a set of tests to assess personality based on these ancient knowledge traditions. And then I went and uh, developed my own algorithm based software for which I have a patent pending. And that is what is online. So through that, what we do is to assess people based on the physical, the psychological, as well as ethical aspects of behavior. So we triangulate all the three analysis to give you an interpretation that is extremely accurate and extremely in-depth. Because there is no other test in the world which assesses the physical, physiological aspect of an individual when you look at psychometric tests. Correct? Mm -hmm. That is what we have been able to achieve along with the ethical interpretation. That's how we are very unique. So, so, doctor. Um, so, I, I just wanted to understand, uh, you know, how are you helping schools uh, with these tests and and your software as well? So, um, how can this be used for for school students? Do, don't you think they're too young to to understand these things for us to be assessing their personalities, and um, you know, for us to tell them that okay, you know, this is the way you're behaving, and you, we need you to modify this. Uh, are they moldable at that age? No, what we do with students is not, um, you know, in that manner. Yes, we do assess the personality, but we are looking at it from a completely different perspective. We are looking at it from the perspective of giving them career and vocational guidance based on what gives them happiness. So inherently, we are all seeking something in life. So our personalities are geared towards seeking something in life for that fulfillment. So with our uh, tests and analysis, we have been able to fine tune it to such a degree that based on the person's prakriti or the uh, or the, uh, the personality, as we call it, the physical, physiological, as well as the psychological aspect, we are able to tell the students and we work only with high school students, not below. Below that, you're absolutely correct. They should not be um, you know, made to undergo any kind of psychometric testing, it's really irrelevant because they're still, their minds are still being formed. They're still maturing. So it's not even going to give you any answers. Mm -hmm. So it's only at the high school, the ninth, eighth, ninth, 10th standard grades that, you know, we can understand what is it that they are leaning towards. And that's mm -hmm. what we work with. We tell them what is the kind of career choices they should make, which is in alignment with your personality and which will give them happiness later. And I strongly feel that this is what is needed um, for the society to have more well-rounded as well as happy children. Because today, most parents, um, you know, push their children into an engineering or a medical uh, uh, degree by paying donations, by rigging the whole system, whatever, all that is, uh, you know, besides the point. But uh, there is tremendous amount of pressure on children to get into engineering and medical. And I have counseled so many parents, not teachers, uh, sorry, not students, parents to allow their children to select a career that they want to do, which is when they are more passionate about it, which is when they are more committed to, towards it and they are more happy. And this is going to really help us to reduce the frustration and deviant behavior in society. And that's what I feel very strongly about. Uh, so uh, how should parents nurture uh, the children's curiosity in a very early age? Allow them to do what they want. I'm not saying, uh, you know, allow in the sense not whatever uh, deviant behavior and, uh, you know, being socially unacceptable behavior. That's not what I mean. Allow the children to explore whatever they want to do with play, um, with studies, in every which way. Don't curtail children to any degree. And 
I, I love then the curiosity. Expect, um, you know, uh, encourage the curiosity of children. Today, we in India as a society, we have the tendency to shut children up whenever they ask questions. So that is a very wrong tendency. I love children. I mean, it's curiosity and that enthusiasm to learn something new, which is going to build society, right? It is not by shutting people down, shutting children down, that you're going to get a developed or a better uh, uh, society. So allowing that curiosity, encouraging cr curiosity, encouraging problem solving behavior, that is key to us improving as a society. Sure, doctor. So, um... I just had one more question um, around the national education policy. So you mentioned that uh, in, on your website from, from what uh, I've read is that the, the psychometric tests that are available are uh, in line with the national education policy of 2020. So can you talk a little bit about how that is aligned? Yeah, so the new NEP 2020, the National Education Policy 2020, mandates that, you know, the, uh, uh, the school system should encourage uh, or uh, teach children more about Indian culture, tradition, values, and incorporate aspects of yoga, Ayurveda, and all the you know my mythological uh, uh, you know aspects into the school curriculum, so that they are more aware about the um, the history of India, the culture and tradition of India. So since we are developed based on the Indian knowledge system, we, we are entirely uh, you know um, completely in. Uh, we are based on the Indian knowledge system. We have emerged from this. YM has emerged from that tradition. We are totally in alignment with that. And the recommendations that we give as far as uh, you know, career guidance is concerned also is taken from the Puranic perspective and validated in today's scenario. So uh, the Bhagavata Purana, the Agni Purana, there are so many other Puranas which talk about the kind of, um, you know, professions which would be more suited to people. And this is not based on caste system. Mm -hmm. This is not based on the Varnashrama system. This is based purely on the inner aspect of the person. What the person's personality is based on their prakriti, based on their mentality, based on their psyche. And that is what we have incorporated into our work as well as validating it with the current tradition, uh, sorry, the current uh, um, the, uh, job profiles that we are looking at. And that is how we are 100% in alignment with NEP 2020. Uh, so coming back to NEP, uh, so are schools equipped with the infrastructure to support uh, NEP? No, but I think that is the whole point, that they are being uh, given the uh, necessary support to build that kind of infrastructure. And that there are so many organizations that are doing it. RIE is one, NCRT that is. And so many other organizations are working towards, uh, you know, helping them. So I don't think NEP 2020 was an arbitrary choice. There are hundreds of professors, hundreds of you know researchers who are working in that area to support that work. And I know, and I know quite a few of them, and I'm uh, you know working with so many of them in this area. So I'm quite aware of what they are doing, the amount of work that they are doing. And uh, is the NEP structure going to be consistent in the whole country, or is it going to change from region to region? No, I believe the uh, the thought is that that it has to be consistent across the country and not be different region to region. There will definitely be certain flavors, uh, you know, as far as the states are concerned, to bring in the state uh, level history and culture and all that stuff. But predominantly, I think the idea has been to bring about a uniformity in structure and uh, modules that the children are taught. Because today, if you look at the state syllabus and the CBSE or ICSE, there's a market change. There's a huge amount of difference um, in the levels of education that are taught. I think that is what is being tackled. They want to eradicate that level of uh, difference to bring in equality and, uh, you know, amongst the children to have a uniform um, knowledge system in place. Uh, and since NEP opens up a lot of opportunities, career opportunities, so how should uh, people uh, build their careers based on it? You spoke about career building as your, one of your uh, services. So uh, you can give some advice on how they should build or what should be done. NEP is not going to give you a differential career building. NEP is only going to structure things around your 
uh, around our Indian tradition culture, giving you an um, uh, knowledge about the history and tradition in India that uh, India uh, that India is so famous for. And based on that, there are, the career opportunities are plenty because, like you see today, you have opportunities in every field of. Uh, human life and uh, society the same continues but we i think that uh, the thrust is also going to be on how we can bring in indian culture and tradition along with modern technology to give students that extra edge worldwide in a worldwide scenario so doctor I, uh, initially you, you you spoke about the indian knowledge tradition and uh, the triangulation method so uh, I, what I also was um, interested to see in your website was the, the five element theory where you mentioned air, water, earth. So um, yeah. to talk a little bit about that, how is that, how does that help in, in uh, psychometric analysis? Yeah. So um, across India has six uh, schools of thought, the Shad Darshanas. And across all the six, uh, you know, the common, uh, um, the, the theory that is underlying all of them are the Panchamahabhutas or the five element theory. So that is your ether, air, water, fire, and uh, earth. So entire Ayurveda and yoga is based on the Sankhyan philosophical tradition, which is atheistic, uh, by the way. And they build upon that. And uh, that's how the five elements combine with each other at the physical, psychological level to form the Tridoshas of Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. Dosha means it's not something that is aberrant or something that is wrong. It's just uh, uh, you know a terminology that is uh, inherent to Ayurveda. And your Ayurvedic doctors, when they prescribe medicines, they see your uh, the, your pulse diagnosis, and then they prescribe medicines to bring your uh, you know your uh, uh, your anatomy or your uh, physiology back into normal if it's gone uh, out of the sink. So that physical physiological uh, aspect, the uh, the Panchamahabhutas combine with each other to form the Tridoshas of Vata, Pitta, and Kapha at the physical physiological level. The same Tridosha, uh, sorry, the same Panchamahabhutas combine with each other at the psychological level to form the Trigunas of Sattva, Rajas, and Tam. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is again, like I said, common in uh, uh, Ayurveda. It's common in uh, yoga, where uh, you know, in some of the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, they talk. He talks about how um, each of the gunas of uh, that a person has, um, what kind of asanas that the person should do to stay healthy both psychologically as well as physically, and how there are some asanas and pranayama that are not recommended for a person to perform because it's going to go anti his prakriti and lead him into some sort of disease state. Now, um, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna talks to Arjuna about how a sattvic person behaves, how a rajasic person behaves, how a tamasic person behaves, and he gives an entire elucidation of that. And in fact, uh, Bhagavad Gita is considered to be one of the foremost classical uh, theories of psychology. It's considered to be a psychological um, textbook world over, not only in India, not mm -hmm. only in India. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect is also about, I'm sure uh, living in India, all of us would have, if we have lived with, uh, you know, our uh, parents and grandmothers, uh, uh, grandparents, we all would have heard like, you know, they would say that, you know, in such and such a season, don't eat this kind of food, your pitta will increase, don't eat this kind of food, your vata will increase, especially for, uh, you know, potato and um, the sweet potato and all that, don't eat too much of it, your vata will increase, you'll get that and this and all that. What is that? That's exactly what they are doing it from a food perspective, a nutrition perspective. Mm -hmm. Correct? We have been exposed to it, but we have suppressed it as being grandmother's things. Grandmothers don't know anything, but it's a cycle. We are coming back to those original roots now. Correct? If you eat something that is not good for you, you're definitely going to fall sick. And then we had our mothers and grandmothers come and give us, you know, have this kashaya, drink that thing, don't eat food, just drink milk. What are these? These are all remedies that were uh, that were known to people. And now, because we have come into nuclear families, because we don't want to live with elders, because we have come into cities where such things are not looked upon, we have corporatized ourselves, because of which we have lost the roots. Mm -hmm. And that that and this Panchamahabhuta theory or the five element theory is not really uh, is not restricted only to India. Look at um, Islamist theory. They also believe that we are born from dust and then we go back to dust. Look at Christianity. Uh, it's the same over there. Look at Zoroastrianism. It's the same over there. 
any culture, any religion, and I'm separating the two. I'm not talking about religion in my work. But if you look at the religious aspect, they all talk about how we are born from dust and we go back to dust. In India, the classical texts don't really deal much with religion, which is a misconception many people have. It deals with the uh, spirituality. And if you look at the Vedas, there's hardly anything about God in it. It talks about so much of the elements and how we can incorporate those elements in our life, how to look at the psychological interpretation of those elemental deities. And that is something that I have tried to incorporate in my, in my work. Removing the, um, uh, we don't talk about spirituality at all in our work. We, religion, 100% no. I don't believe that religion has a place in science and technology. But having said that, that's a different institution entirely, which I have a lot of respect for. But I don't want to bring it into my work to make it into one more guru, guru, guru and all that stuff. So that is totally very different. Right. So, Doctor, uh, you, you spoke about uh, Tridoshas and the Trigunas. So, the Tridoshas is based on the physiological aspects, uh, Trigunas is based on the psychological aspects. So, what is the, the difference between physiology and psychology? Physiology is your body, the human, the physical body that you're born with. Right. Psychology is your mental, psychological state, your feeling, your thought, your emotions. And in India, we don't believe in the Cartesian dichotomy of the body and the mind. In the West, especially, they used to believe until the last 15, 20 or so years ago that the mind and the body are very different entities. And you don't need to study the uh, mind to understand the body or you don't need to study the body to understand the mind. But India does not have that uh, fallacy at all. We don't believe in that because uh, like you and I know, so many diseases are psychosomatic in nature. It is because that we are undergoing a lot of physical stress that we develop a lot of BP or diabetes or any other lifestyle disorders. And most of the diseases that we have today in the world are lifestyle disorders, which are eminently treatable, which are preventable. More than treatable, they are preventable. And India does not believe that, you know, uh, you should not study the two in conjunction with each other to understand a human. If you tell me that, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to understand uh, you, I just want to understand your mind, it's not going to happen because my body is going to dictate whether I'm concentrating with what you're saying, whether I can re respond to you properly or not, and so many other things, and whether I want to respond to you in a certain way or not. And if you say, I can't just leave my body out of the room and come back here with only my mind, whether I like it or not, I am one entity. And all of them are functioning in tandem with each other to give rise to me and my thoughts, my uh, talk and my work. Correct. And that's a fallacy that I have seen a lot of psychologists world over do. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. You only need this. No, you don't need that. You have to have everything in unison. And which is what Ayurveda talks about. It looks at the human uh, person as a tripod, the body, the mind, as well as the spirit. If you separate one from the other, what is left? There's nothing left, you know? Yeah. We are not in coma that you can just say, remove the mind. I only want to study the body. Uh, so coming to universities, uh, so how can uh, the universities use your services for admission procedure for their universities? Yes, that is, I think, to democratize... Uh, you know education more because if you see world over they all have entrance exams every university has entrance exams they have a psychometric assessment to see whether you're capable of doing the course that they are offering every course has certain qualities that uh, or characteristics that are needed from the student to be able to complete it, and complete it well. if i'm trying to you know do engineering because my neighbor is uh, doing engineering then my interest is uh, you know towards medicine it's a total disaster, if you ask me. And you need to understand whether the person, whether the student you're taking in is fit to do engineering. Today, we have seen so many engineering students who have you know, written multiple levels of their exams, but still are not able to clear one or two exams. And then they finally drop out of engineering. Why is that? The same thing happens with medical. Why do we have so many collapsing bridges all across India? 
why do have why do we have so many collapsing you know buildings all across india because the wrong engineer constructed it because he was put into engineering by force perhaps i don't know and the only way that we can call out all these kind of irregularities is by understanding whether the student has the aptitude to do the course and the rigor that is needed for every course even if the person wants to take up uh, you know home science or arts or um, whatever course it is there is a certain rigor attached to every course every learning at the university level and you need to ensure universities need to ensure that the student has the necessary mentality and the mindset to undergo that rigor to be able to to have the passion to complete the course and continue in that field of work how many girl medical um, girl students who have completed medical do we know who are sitting at home now because they are not interested in doing it they were forced to do a medical course isn't that a criminal waste of uh, money resources and a seat with some other student could have used why are we not doing that as a society why are we allowing something like this and i personally know so many yoga teachers who have a, uh, a engineering degree mm -hmm. i do an engineering degree and come into yoga you need to do different courses to come into yoga why take away that engineering degree from somebody who's more uh, who who would probably do more with it and continue with it in your life you know you those are things that are a criminal waste that i see in our society today and all due to wrong pressures and this has to be stopped and this has to be taken cognizance of by the university by the ugc implement certain aspects where they can do this kind of a discretionary en enrollment you know and then once the student is in also and that is where we help that is where swayam helps to understand whether the person whether the student is capable of continuing with that kind of education or not once the person is inside also a lot of students today in india world over not only in india they don't know what their strengths are they don't know how to capitalize on their strengths mm -hmm. so our test helps them to understand what their strengths are what are the areas that they have an aptitude for and uh, you need to write uh, if you want to study abroad especially you need to write your statement of pur uh, purpose the sops and for that they ask you what are your strengths how are you going to capitalize your strengths and our test will help you do that Uh, am I audible, doctor? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, um, when you talk about the, the the psychometric test, so is there a way to get around the the test, like to fool the test? Uh, you know, what if students don't like filling it filling it out? What if students don't don't like the idea of being tested psychometrically? No, lots of people don't like the idea, but that's totally personal to them. Mm -hmm. um, but coming to the question of whether it can be fooled, highly doubtful. i'll tell you the reason mm. because uh, you know when you look at the panch mahabhutas and uh, sorry the five elements and stuff like that so there is a set pattern and i've already done a huge amount of research in this area published papers um in national international journals and our tests are being used for research in multiple uh, um well known um, organizations worldwide so uh, in multiple use cases um, so and what we have noticed is that it's very difficult to uh, scam this test the reason is because at the physical level whatever your um, prakriti is uh, whatever your constitution is the same reflects in the psychological level also there is a direct correlation over there Hmm. okay and we know what uh, correlation is correct what correlation is wrong what correlation can be accepted not accepted all that stuff and we have done the coding into all that all those different multiple scenarios in our uh, you know algorithm and so the minute a person answers it whether we know whether the, the he or she is scamming it whether they've done it genuinely not genuinely so hmm. the whole thing is there in the system automatically gets generated for everybody to see right yeah so it's difficult to scan it and the questions are very simple it's mm. all related to you and your you know what kind of food you like to eat what kind of um, you know how much you like to sleep what kind of tastes you like things like that so why would somebody okay even if you want to lie about it so we have inbuilt uh, certain mechanisms where we can catch the wrong answers sure. yeah 
So, Shreyas, uh, can we move to the next question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, coming to corporates and companies, uh, what do they expect of a, uh, an engineer, let's say? Uh, what soft skills do they expect from an engineer or someone they want to recruit? I'm not, uh, we don't get into soft skills at all. We don't get into the skill set at all when we do the assessments. Mm -hmm. When we work with companies, what we do is to identify the personality of the person. And every company has a set of, uh, you know, job roles that they want the person to fill. And what are the kind of roles the person has to do, whether it's a service role or a sales role? And what are the kind of, you know, uh, different traits that are expected in the company? So along with our general, uh, analysis that we do we also analyze so the company tells us that i want to hire this person for a sales role tell me whether he's going to be able to do a b c d e uh, you know kind of roles which requires certain um, a, a b c d e kind of traits what we do is we assess that hmm. and today uh, the other problem that hr departments are facing is that everybody is going to resume writers they have excellent resumes uh, you know the the presentation is very good obviously and so on and so forth. And when they come to the interview also, you know, they're presenting themselves well. They have read up on Glassdoor. They have read up on all these other sites where they know what is the kind of questions that are being asked. So there is no surprise questions as such that comes very rarely, especially uh, more so it might come at the senior levels. But at the junior mid-management levels, generally there are no that kind of surprise questions and they all come prepared. So then what happens? How do you identify a candidate A from candidate B? who are equally good, they're presenting well. Mm. The truth comes out only three months or six months after they're in a company. Yeah. So we will help you to identify whether the person is going to be a performer or a, a you know total in bank terminology, if you want to use, it's going to be an NPA, non-performing asset that you are hiring before you hire the person and spend all that kind of money for your recruitment, and then training the person, paying the person for the next three to six months until you fig figure out whether they're good or not. And then it's very difficult for companies to kick people out also. There's a huge, uh, you know, legal and all the other issues that come in. And also it uh, also reduces the morale of the other people in the company. So with our tests, since we are able to do all these different kinds of analysis and meta-analysis, we can tell the company whether they should hire the person or not, what kind of roles they will fit, or even if you want to reorganize your existing resources, because now today everybody, every company wants to just don't want to hire. They want to reorganize existing resources to see how they can get the most out of the people there. So yeah. there also we are able to step in and give you the necessary inputs to say whether, you know, this person has, though this person has this qualification and so on and experience, they also have certain other qualities which will help them perform this job better. So there is also going to be a lot of mix and match that they will do and which companies are more looking forward to rather than having to hire people, new people or throw off existing people. And especially in the current scenario, very difficult. And the other aspect that we also work with is with trainers and coaches, because every uh, employee needs to undergo training and, uh, you know, development. And when we know the inherent strengths of the person or the weaknesses and or the weaknesses, it's easy for us to uh, identify the catch points, you know, the points where they need training, where they need more support, which will help them perform better. And this is a capital uh, capitalization that, uh, you know, trainers are doing now, because otherwise it's difficult to understand the inherent strengths and weaknesses. So with our tests and our reports, they're able to do that. Right. So um, when you when you spoke about that, uh, there was one more question which popped into my head. Uh, so you you just spoke about because of the pandemic, you know, people are not hiring from outside. They're, they're trying to promote from within the organization. So maybe before the pandemic, maybe that was not the scenario in all the organizations. You know, uh, yes, organizations yes. may uh, may uh, you know they they're sort of uh, they want to hire externally especially for leadership positions, um, you know, to fill leadership positions, maybe they hire externally from somewhere else instead of promoting someone uh, from the uh, within the organization, promoting someone trying to develop them, nurture them from within the organization. So uh, before the pandemic, why do you think that, that this may have been the case? Why do organizations hire externally where, wherein they pay the, the other person a lot more than uh, nurturing someone and developing someone within the organization, they pay them quite less, uh, maybe in terms of increments or hikes. I'm not saying that this 
this is what happens in all the organizations but you know there have been reports that in certain organizations uh, the recruiters do this or even uh, the, the promoters of the organization they are they are a lot more inclined to do to bring in someone externally as opposed to nurturing someone from within the organization and bringing them up so, so just to give some context for example uh, sundar pichai who is the ceo of alphabet right now uh, when he joined google in 2004 he joined google as an associate product manager as part of their uh, apm program so he was uh probably given the opportunity to to rise up the ranks of course even he might he might have contributed a lot more he worked really hard to 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 come up but uh you know that sort of trends it, it, you know we are not seeing at least many in many indian companies so uh why do you believe that that might be the case so i think there are multiple reasons for this it's not just one reason you know one is that when you bring in a new person they have a very different a new perspective you, like bringing in fresh blood into the organization so you might want uh, you know um, the organization may be stagnating and they want some fresh perspective so they bring in a new uh, uh, um, a higher level leadership uh, team from outside because they have that exposure they are going to have different ways of thinking where they can pull up the organization to a different level that could be one reason the second reason could be that you know your uh, um, he that he or she is working in your competitors organization and it's a strategic uh, uh, kind of an investment where they want to you know uh, bring in from your competitor so that you know they can uh, reduce their chances of going up and increase your chances of being higher mm -hmm. uh, the third is that maybe that that person has the qualities which are really superlative which your current organizational employees don't have Hmm. and another could be that your uh, organizational your employees may not have the capacity to uh, even after training they might not have the capacity to rise up to that kind of roles so uh, um, not everybody can be a sundar pichai hmm. correct so we can't take just one outlier example and say that why can't you do it here hmm. so there are so many multiple reasons for that so lots of people i have noticed they don't even want to go to a higher level because it will involve lot more responsibility lot more stress they are more bothered about your work life balance mm. they don't want they, that level of ambition is not there in people so then what you do you have to bring in people from outside sure so plenty of reasons for that right so uh, what do you think uh, are the traits of a leadership traits of a leadership i think is one is acceptance being open to change and being open to listen to others and being uh, able to see far ahead because if i'm only going to look at my current scenario and say that today uh, you know i have to earn 100 rupees if i if not i can't support my family tomorrow i want 100 so at the end of the month i want 3000 rupees with that i'll be happy that's not going that's not a really uh, that's not a leader at all forget good that's not a leader at all so it's not only about today if you have read about uh, uh, you know some of the quotes of jeff uh, bezos the uh, amazon person um, uh, he is talking about setting in place uh, you know their targets 3 years in advance so whatever they are achieving today is what have been their targets which have been set 3 years in advance so that is a leader you know to be able to see where the future is leading and how can i get my organization up to speed so that 3 years down the line i am not stuck it's not only about today it's about tomorrow and tomorrow and the tomorrow after that that i have to worry about as a leader sure so uh was one more question uh, doctor uh, about uh, hard work and and talent so uh, we've been asking hard this work and hard work and talent talent huh. so uh, yeah we we've, we've been asking this question to to a lot of our guests uh, so we just wanted to know what you think about this because um, do you obviously hard work is something which which we can control as individuals our work ethic uh, how hard we work uh, you know what we do on a daily basis uh, on an incremental basis to uh, to improve ourselves but but is is talent uh, is that something uh, that is that is something which is existent uh within a certain person and that is not something which can be developed or can you do you think that talent can also be worked upon uh, or is it something that a person is born with um okay so talent is definitely that's an aptitude that i have towards any kind of a um 
uh, towards any kind of work or you know anything that i have to do want to do what but having said that i think hard work trumps every time because i might have the talent but if i'm not going to be hard working so what what will i do with a person who's talented but doesn't want to work who's not inclined to work but whereas if i have a hard hard working person who has only maybe about 10% of the talent that is required if they are hard working they will outperform every time day by day every day and i would much rather hire somebody who's hard working rather than somebody who's very talented but who i don't know whether they're going to perform every time right yeah uh and and one more question uh, which i think we we touched up, touched upon this uh, before we started the call is about uh, prakriti yoga so uh, something which, yeah. which you are very passionate about so can you talk a little bit about that yeah so like i also mentioned earlier uh, the yoga that we do uh, you know in the classical text at least if you see is based on what your prakriti is hmm. so uh, prakriti is your physical physiological psychological as well as your ethical or spiritual aspect so all three put together is your prakriti so your and whatever prakriti you're born with uh, is um, uh, uh, when you're in your mother's womb only it is conceived when you're conceived only your uh, you know your prakriti is decided and that doesn't change so uh, when you are born there are certain aspects of you that uh, you know um, that need certain things like if i am uh, let's say if i am pitta dominant person then i shouldn't be eating lot of spicy food though pitta dominant people love eating spicy oily all that kind of food you shouldn't be eating it because pitta dominant people have a tendency to develop high bp uh, later on in their life maybe after their 35 40 or so so in the same way there are certain because of your prakriti again there are certain asanas and pranayamas that you should do for you to overcome that so just pick your your pitta dominant that is your prakriti if you try to make it uh, you know vata dominant try make it vata dominant or kapha dominant it's not going to happen but in that process you're going to damage yourself you're going to set you're setting yourself up to get sick so what yoga sutras tell us is that your prakriti based on your prakriti is what you should be doing your asanas and pranayama so they recommend certain asanas and pranayama for people based on your prakriti and also tell you to avoid certain asanas and pranayama and kriyas and all that based on your prakriti to make sure that you don't injure yourself now let me give you an example coming back to the pitta dominant uh, prakriti person only obviously let's say that you are pitta dominant you have a tendency to one is that you get angry very fast okay you like um, uh, lots of spicy and oily and that kind of food and you're also more, uh, you love to um, you're very aggressive by nature and you like to do a lot of contact sports like football cricket uh, not cricket uh, rugby and you know things like that so these are all, you have a higher metabolic rate so you burn out uh, burn up that much more uh, thing you tend to feel hungry a lot more all those things are associated now when you're doing yoga so there is also uh, such kind of people like to do vigorous yoga they don't like to do the slower kind of yoga so, so uh, prakriti uh, sorry pitta dominant prakriti people are recommended to do slow yoga so that you can slow you down to give you that calmness of mind because otherwise you tend to be even more you tend to all these contact sports and everything tend to increase your level of aggression increase your level of metabolism increase your level of other aspects metabolism metabolic uh, aspects in your body so when you are doing that you are also pushing your blood B, uh, bp higher and higher so when you come to yoga if you are doing if you do kapalabhati uh, uh, kriya uh, you know then that also increases your bp okay then if you do headstands shirasana that also increases your bp so when you are doing asanas and pranayama when you are already prone to get high bp when you are already prone to get acidity and all that you are doing asanas and pranayama and kriyas which are going to increase that further first is you start developing acidity you start developing higher um, the, you know neck pain and uh, catches and things like that and then when you continue to do these kind of things there is a possibility of a person developing uh, stroke because of the high uh, blood pressure you know it pops a nerve in the brain which is and this is commonly studied in anatomy uh, by uh, allopathic doctors it's a common phenomenon we know about it but do we know why it happens 
and how we can stop it from happening. That is where understanding your prakriti and then deciding what kind of asanas and pranayama is crucial. It's the same with any other uh, psychosomatic diseases, lifestyle diseases. These are all in our hands. But just because my neighbor is so fit, he's doing, he or she is doing headstands and they're able to do 500 uh, kapalabhati at uh, you know a time. I'm also trying to do that. I'm pushing myself to do that and I'm popping on them. Mm. Really, is it worth it? And today you have uh, so many researchers world over in Australia, in New Zealand, and in uh, US and all that, where they are recommending people to not do yoga because it's detrimental. Why is it detrimental? Because you're doing the wrong type of yoga, not yoga. Not all yoga is bad, but the yoga that is recommended for me is good for me. If you make me do the yoga that is not good for me, definitely I'm going to injure myself. So there is a strong correlation and a strong connection between what my body needs and what I give it. And when I don't follow that, that's when that risk and when, well, sorry, that risk, uh, that injury comes up. And to stave it off, to stop that from happening is what we are trying to work with and doing this prakriti based asanas, pranayama, food. Food is also such an important thing. Like I mentioned to you earlier, your uh, you know, parents and grandparents would have told you, don't eat this kind of food because you're going to get into, uh, you know, get more vata, get more gas, get more anger or get more acidity and stuff like that. And these are all studied, these are all well-known, uh, not research, but these are all well-known grandmother's remedies that we have followed since generations, but forgotten today. So we need to go back to our roots, but understand it from a more scientific perspective. And demystifying that aspect is what moves me so much about my work. I love that. Sure, sure, doctor. So uh, you spoke about the triangulation method, wherein uh, you you also mentioned that it is both the physical, um, psychological, and the ethical aspects of of a person. So I can understand the physical and the psychological, but <clears throat> how about the ethical aspect of a person? Like how how can you say that a particular person is going to uh, behave in a certain way, and he, he's always, always going to be, uh, he's always going to follow the rules and regulations. He's, he's not going to be involved in something shady at, at some point of time in his career. So, uh, you know, how do we, how do we judge that? Yeah. So, um, you know, um, like I to told you earlier, also the mm -hmm. prakriti of a person is composed of the physical, physiological, the psychological, and mm -hmm. then the spiritual or the ethical. So, because corporate culture doesn't allow you to talk about spiritual we said that you know we are going to look at the ethical aspect of it because if a person is highly spiritual obviously they are more ethical mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. if i am such a um, uh, if i am very spiritual that i believe that there is god that you know i am answerable to him and mm -hmm. so on and so forth then i would definitely not be involved in uh, you know definitely arms and you know drug dealing and things like that right so there is a high and very strong correlation between high spirituality and high ethical behavior. And this is something that has been studied, researched, all that published worldwide. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, out of the top of my head. Now, when you look at the uh, physical, physiological, the, the Panchamahabhuta theory or the five element theory that I work with, if you uh, again, if you come to the psychological aspect, a person who is sattvic is one who is, uh, you know, you know, the sattvic diet and all that, no onion, no garlic, no meat, obviously no liquor and all that stuff yeah mm. so uh, a person who is sattvic if you uh, this is explained in bhagavad gita also a person who is sattvic is one who is highly spiritual mm. correct so they are those are the persons who will not uh, not f forget uh, think about it they will not even uh, do anything that is uh, unethical mm -hmm. they won't even entertain such thoughts okay in that manner um, there is a um, uh, person whom I've collaborated uh, with in the US and uh, it's a business school uh, and uh, they have uh, developed this entire theory validated with my tool and so on where they have identified people who are prone for unethical behavior in business uh, settings mm -hmm. and it has been proved published and proved yeah. so yeah. there are multiple such researches that we have collaborated on and worked which shows and there are certain combinations of people whether the physical or the psychological and both 
those interpretations, correlations that we have done. But there are certain combinations of people who are more prone to get into, uh, you know, unethical kind of behavior. While there are certain ones who might, might, might not get into it. And there are others who are purely ethical. They will not do. You give them money, you give them anything, they will not do anything unethical. Mm -hmm. So there is a vast amount of literature that is there, uh, research literature I'm talking about, that we can depend upon. So that's how I say that, you know, we are able to map the ethical aspect of a person. Uh, so um, talking about the uh, personality and behavioral assessment. So is there a difference there? Is there a slight difference or are, are they both the same personality and behavior? Personality is what the person is composed of. What is your personality? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you somebody who is uh, who tends more towards the ethical, more towards the mid range, more towards the lower range, whatever? And uh, what is your uh, all those things are the personal? That is your personality. Behavior is how do I understand your behavior in context to a business setting, in context to an uh, organizational setting, in context to a school setting? So those are behavioral issues that we study and uh, you know analyze and give you an analysis. As to what is it that you should be like for students, if you see, we will analyze your personality and tell you what is the kind of behavior you're prone for. So going to certain career uh, paths because this is going to help you. Now, to give you an to give you an example there uh, so that it makes it easy for you to understand. Let's say that you are a, uh, a purely a creative oriented person. Okay, a vata dominant person is very creative. They're extremely into sports. They are into adventure sports. Um, you know, they are out of the box creative, um, and so on and so forth. But they're also highly unreliable. That way. They can't sit down at one place and work day in and day out. The same kind of work, they will tear their hair out and run away from it. Now, look at any creative person that you know. This will fit the bill there. Okay, there will be definitely there will be different permutations and combinations. So I'm not talking about that. I'm just giving you a very bold example to make you understand. So if so, this is my assessment of your personality. That's why I'm now for you to for me to tell you what is the kind of uh, career role that you should uh, choose. Such persons are not fitted uh, are not fit to get into a job like a CA, you know or uh, or an admin kind of a role or a factory manager kind of a role where you have to go to the workplace nine to five kind of a job yeah. it's a desk job do the same kind of job day in and day out they can't do it they will quit after three months and for the company their attrition goes are high correct so that is what we mean when we say understanding your personality as well as analyzing your behavior to tell you what you should ideally be doing but then the final choice is yours we cannot force you to yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. So, Shreya, uh, any more questions you have nothing else i think all questions are answered so i had a question on retention increasing retention but yeah the previous question answered it yeah, yeah. that's so important which companies don't realize yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sure, doctor. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Uh, thank thanks you. for taking your thank time. You so much. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a great learning experience for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We have lots more to come on this channel since we have lined up a few more guests after this. Be sure to like, share and subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive updates. In the description below, I have provided the LinkedIn page link followers on LinkedIn to receive new notifications. So until next time, it's goodbye.